American Psychiatric Association 1995 annual meeting. What is psychiatry all about? Leston L. Havens, MD. The History and Library Committee wants to welcome you to the uh, Benjamin Rush uh, lecture for today. Uh, you are in room 125, incidentally, and we will be in process from 2 o'clock to about 2.30. This year we are extremely honored to have as our speaker Dr. Leston Haven, professor of psychiatry at Harvard. Dr. Haven is a true Renaissance man with a wide-ranging interests and expertise uh, ranging from uh, uh, such early issues as rehabilitation, existentialism, uh, and efforts to integrate uh, theories of all kinds with research and clinical practice. It's in over a hundred publications. I'm definitely not going to list them all. Uh, Approaches to the Mind is probably a book of his that you will all remember. Uh, and visiting professorships uh, all over the map. His interest in the history of our field is evident as far back as 1965 uh, when he published a paper on uh, Krepland, as well as one on Charcot and Hysteria, a few years later on Carl Jaspers and Pierre Genet and Harry Stack Sullivan as well. He's uh, provided a historical perspective on diagnosis in psychiatry and searched from, from this broad perspective for a general theory of therapy. Or uh, more broadly stated, as he did in 1991, what do we do? Thus, his title today is appropriate and provocative, What is Psychiatry All About? And in these times, we dearly need to know. Dr. Haven. Is this all right, Cliff? No. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. I am. Um, I'm trying to think of something that will allay my anxiety on this occasion. I'm, I'm very grateful for the committee having given me this honor, and I hope to do some justice to it. <clears throat> I'm particularly anxious because two of my family are here, and their judgments are astringent, merciless, ultimately forgiving, but in the meantime, you know, uh, I also want to thank them, my daughter Jennifer Havens, my son-in-law Peter Wyden, my wife Susan Miller Havens, and uh, my dear friend Ed Hundert, who have helped shepherd me through the perils of this effort and saved me. You, not, you will find from everything, but from some things that you can be happy you are not being subjected to. Can you hear me all right? Am I audible? Um, <clears throat> I also want to express my thanks to John William Miller, a man none of you probably know, but who was a professor of mine at Williams College over 50 years ago, and who gave me the theme for this lecture. I didn't know it then. I wouldn't have known it at all if one of his students, George Brockway, who was the owner and president of Norton for many years, hadn't published his lectures. And I recommend to you a, a little book called In Defense of the Psychological by Miller, which I must have heard over 50 years ago. But when I read it again, I realized that this was the theme for these remarks to you today, no doubt shaping my whole direction very, very many years ago. <coughs> now what I want to say to you, what I, want to, what I want to try to persuade you that psychiatry is all about, is a simple idea, although it's within it are nested all kinds of difficulties, obstructions, the history of our field, I think. I believe psychiatry is about the synthesizing capacity of the brain. It is about the capacity of our brains, brain-mind, I will try to persuade you that's the best expression today, the capacities of our brain-minds to, 
to use the vernacular to hold it together or to use the more sophisticated language of some of the psychologies to grant us self-possession. That this matter of synth synthetic capacity and self-possession and the intrusions on those constitute the subject matter of psychiatric work. Now psychiatric work is difficult because the complexities of self-possession, the complexities of synthetic function mean that it is often incomplete or intruded upon. The result is the central fact, in my opinion, of psychiatric work. The central fact, I believe, is that the patients are hard to get at. The patients are hard to get at. Now I'm going to ring the changes on this idea over the next three quarters of an hour <clears throat> and try to persuade you that the field has developed as this problem has been bit by bit approached. Now this isn't what psychiatry is usually said to be about. Over 20 years ago, I wrote a book called Approaches to the Mind in which I laid out the different things that the psychiatric schools had claimed psychiatry was about. The brain, the unconscious mind, society, the problems of being in the world, and the values of being in the world. These separate conceptions meant that we have had no psychiatry as a un unified discipline but instead a series of sectarian claims springing from each of these points of view. We have no physiology or pathophysiology uniting our specialties. Perhaps we will have one, perhaps we are approaching it in the extraordinary explosion of information, especially about the chemical properties of the brain. But presently we have none. And therefore, we often refer to our business, we often say that psychiatry is all about what I call a terminological suturing, that is biopsychosocial psychiatry. And by means of those, those hyphens between those words, we collect as best we can this curious business, which is our preoccupation, our occupation, and often our, our delight as well as our frustration. Now the best way that I can think of to explain why it is biopsychosocial psychiatry and at the same time to move us from that conception to the conception of, of the synthesizing properties of brain is to just remind you of simple clinical facts. What happens when we meet the patient? What happens when we are called upon to be useful to the patient? is a series of things which can roughly be divided into three steps. We form a judgment about the condition or the complaint. We have become very sophisticated in, in drawing these judgments and complaints and symptoms and signs into syndromes. At the same time, or, or following it, we also try to form an impression, we try to form an impression of what might have led to these symptomatic developments. And then, of course, we plan some kind of intervention that we hope will be decisive against the syndrome. Many times, in fact, I think as a rule generally, we are unable to decide what is the matter beyond the syndromic description. Some of us would prefer social ideologies, others biological ideologies, still others would, would much prefer to have a, an account based upon psychological considerations in, alone. The fact is, however, that the patients are hard to get at in the sense of understanding what the source of the syndromic disturbance could be. Sometimes that isn't true. Sometimes a patient will come to us and simply say, you know, I can't stand my mother-in-law, she's keeping me awake at night, help me go to sleep. 
And we'd respond to those simple requests in simple ways by reassurance, by medication, by interpretation, by the interventions we know so well. On the whole, however, what, it, what happens to us is very different. We form a judgment on the syndrome, and then we stand before the syndrome puzzled about the causes, not helpless, however, because we have many interventions, particularly today, powerful pharmacological interventions, which make the reversal of the syndrome sometimes almost complete. And let me just give an illustration of, of the kind of problem that occurs to us, a, a, simple, a simple illustration, an easy case, you might say. A young man comes into my office, a man in his 30s, comes into my office in, in a frantic state, hyperactive, talking very rapidly, extremely anxious, giving at the same time an air of, in, of evasiveness or uncertainty as to his purposes or, or place in my office. Without any difficulty, I immediately identify phenomena which we would call manic. I was also very struck, however, by the uncertainty of his approach to me. Uh, I, also, I felt that if I were to medicate him swiftly, as was a temptation certainly, I would be in danger of not knowing whether he would use the medication or misuse the medication, or indeed whether he would come back at all. Now here is, here is the problem of the difficulty of getting at the patient. I had to do something which would ensure that there developed between the patient and me a sufficient relationship to bear the investigation of phenomena that might reveal what was up, and also a relationship strong enough to ensure that the treatment materials would be adequately uh, uh, ingested or whatever. Now, at the end of these remarks, I'm going to review something I'm going to say only in summary now. I was concerned that this man feel understood I was very concerned that his self-esteem, which already, of course, is threatened by being in a psychiatrist's office, that his self-esteem be in every way protected. And I also was very concerned that I lay before him whatever ideas I had about this state he was in, in such a way as to be modestly, respectfully submitted and responded to. Now, I did my best along those three classic lines. And as a result, and somewhat to my surprise, he told me that he had discovered that his employer at work, his immediate boss, was selling company secrets to another company. He didn't know if his boss knew that he knew that this was happening. It didn't take me very long to surmise as well that my patient was eager to take his boss's position. Nor was it easy nor was it difficult to surmise that the, that the range of conflicts in this situation is it would be enough to make him anxious. What I didn't know yet, though, was whether if he aired this to me and we could evolve a plan by which this syndrome might be elite, relieved, I didn't know whether the manic or hypomanic type behavior would subside. Indeed, we did those things. He completed his description of the situation. We even, in the last few minutes of the time together, were able to arrive at a kind of plan of what he might do next to protect himself, to protect the company, and perhaps, lo and behold, secure the job of his boss. The next time I saw him, which was about five days later, he was calm. He had slept in the, well in the, in the interim. He had uh, gone about his work effectively. And over the next few months, he straightened the situation out stayed very steady, and to my knowledge of about three years of intermittently seeing him, he was never manic again. Now that was an easy case, which I will come back to later. It was a relatively easy for me to get at some of the factors, by no means all, some of the factors which lay behind this syndromic manifestation. Now if we ask ourselves, what systematic understanding we have of why the patients are hard to get at, we, could, we can immediately tell the story of psychiatric developments in general. Well, 
Once upon a time, we were told that the wandering uterus explained this obscurity of symptoms. Later, the devil was invoked as an explanation. In the 20th century, however, there has been widespread agreement that it is either the mind or the brain which is at fault. Now, one of the most extraordinary, perhaps the most extraordinary development of my 40 years in this business has been the slow revelation, which is no longer so slow, but has developed slowly over the last 30 years, that the mind and the brain are equal to each other. As many of you know, today we have an understanding of brain that is at last worthy of mind. Is at last sufficiently complicated, plastic, self-correcting, developmentally based, so that we can understand how the mind can do the things that the brain had to be doing for it. Now this is, this is a, a change that, the, that only the older people in the audience will be able to appreciate in its full enormity. When I went to medical school, the brain was a kind of blob, a sort of hardwired blob, which was settled once and for all very soon after gestation, almost. And um, <clears throat> the idea that it could correct itself, that it was plastic in form, above all, above all, the idea that the brain was as individual as the mind which springs from it, that was utterly an unknown idea in the teachings I had. Let me give you just one example of the extraordinary extent to which the individuality of the brain is now an irrefutable fact among us. I was reading the letters section of the New England Journal of Medicine not long ago and I came across a letter from Germany, in which the brains of monozygotic twins corrected for handedness, I hadn't known you had to correct them for handedness, monozygotic twins corrected for handedness had pictures of the sulcal and gyral formations, the gross formations of the cortex placed side by side. What was extraordinary about these pictures was the obviousness of the conclusion that the monozygotic twins have grossly different brain structures. I said this to my wonderfully learned friend, Ed Hundert, and he said to me, of course, of course, he said, didn't you know that the fingerprints of monozygotic twins are different? Didn't you know that the fine wiring of much of the brain structures in monozygotic twins are strikingly different? Of course, I, I had to say I didn't, because I didn't, but there it was, there it was, plainly before us, this extraordinary individuality of the, of the brain. So my point here is that the patients are hard to get at. Why? They're hard to get at because the brain is an individual, individual organ of individuality. And at last we see in the brain structure, the identifiable brain structure, what I think is the central fact, especially a clinical fact, of psychology. The fact, I think, that's central to psychology is that each of us, each one of us, stares forth from an individually shaped and genetically different nervous system onto a world seen from this time and place by no one else before or ever again. So individuality, sensitivity, and complexity are the properties of the substance that is of major concern to us. So no wonder, no wonder we are hard to get at. This hardness to get at is, I believe, the principal reason that our field seems mysterious and frightening to other people. Because we stand for the fact that indeed humans are not laid out before us like gardens to be walked through and understood, but are mysterious creatures, difficult to understand, strange in their behaviors from alien points of view, and that we are the guardians of that individuality and that fact. And therefore, in, in some sense, guilty by association 
for threatening the whole body politic and cultural with this extraordinary divisiveness of individuality. I think this is also the reason why explanations are so popular among us. Because faced by the mystery and confusion of this individuality, of this difficulty getting at the patient, faced by that we reach, as all humans must, for some kind of understanding, for some explanation. We cannot live with this level of uncertainty. Paul McHugh has recently written an eloquent piece arguing against the, the wildfire spread of explanatory systems in psychiatry, of meaningful systems, of finding meaning in many places. But this could never be stopped because this served the purpose of giving us, if only for a moment, and if in groups of like-minded moments, a sense of scholarly, total intellectual confidence that allowed us to face the depth of the mystery of our, of our lives together. It also explains, I think, uh, a third feature. Not only the fear that our, our patients and ourselves excite in other people, and not only the, the rage for explanation, which is always breaking out among us, but also dsm 4 that extraordinary document of great care, intelligence, modesty. The word disease, to my knowledge, does not occur in it, for example. Only words like syndrome or pattern. But DSM-4, 3 and 4, were efforts to cut down on this mystery, to give us something reportable, sensible, organizable, so we could stand firm somewhere in this shifting individual chaos that is our work. And it has had that effect, I think, apparently, almost widely through the world. Now, we, we know that that gain, that destigmatizing asset of DSM-4, was purchased at a price, but a price that I'm sure that sooner or later we'll be happy to pay. The price was that we thrust to one side the difficulty of getting at the patients. We took up that wonderful medical assumption that the patients, the patient, the reporter, the person who is under study, that that person was a reliable, objective, and cooperative informant. That is the assumption of dsm 4 and it's the assumption of general medicine, and it's part of the medicalization of our field. But unfortunately, that is the one assumption that we cannot make. And what I propose to do in most of what follows is to try to help us develop and review, uh, review and help us develop some of the means by which we face this reporter problem in psychiatric work. Now this, this difficulty is most evident in the courtroom. In the courtroom, opposing psychiatrists interview the same person, both depend upon the reporting function of the patient, and both come to different conclusions. We sometimes try to blame that on the legal system, but this is not the fault of the legal system. The fault lies in the fact that psychiatric work still depends centrally upon the reliability of the informant. Perhaps the most famous example of this problem is the history of tertiary syphilis. Adolf Meyer reported that, that when the Wasserman test was introduced into Kreplin's Heidelberg Clinic, the number of people with dementia precox, the word for schizophrenia in those days, the number of patients in he the Heidelberg Clinic of Kreplin fell dramatically. My first professor at Harvard, Harry Caesar Solomon, who spent his life studying tertiary syphilis, told me that the patients could present with any syndrome. Many were manic and de or depressed, a great many were seemingly schizophrenic, some were demented, others had neurotic disturbances or psychopathic disturbances. But, he said, if you treated them, and the treatment could be by malarial injection, by the fever boxes or by penicillin, all of those worked very effectively against tertiary, most of tertiary syphilis. If you treated the patient successfully, every one of those syndromes remained except one. You could always tell 
that there was a flavor, and sometimes a very strong flavor still, about the patients that bore on the original syndromic diagnosis. Only mania was, was regularly and completely cured by the tertiary treatment, uh, treatment of tertiary syphilis. <coughs> Peter Wyden tells me that this was also true to some considerable measure of the vitamin deficiency psychoses when they came under uh, vitamin treatment, that they too had shown up with this range of, of diagnostic pictures. Now this, this syndromic story, dependent as Kreplin was on it, maintained its hold over us as a possible disease thing uh, right up until the present. You remember that Kreplin's hope, his hope which he ref reflected on even in the 1920s in his autobiographical remarks, his hope was that by a sufficiently precise account of the clinical presenting picture, one could reason back to the disease cause. Now, not more than 10 or 15 years after he made that, hypo made that hypothesis public and began to work on it, Bonhoeffer in Berlin was able to show in the toxic psychoses that there was no connection between the clinical picture of the psychosis and the etiological agent of the toxic psychosis. Now today, and, and I can remember when 1954, most of the charts were vast. Only after World War II and the advent of psychoanalytic influence on American psychiatry did the historical parts begin to surpass the descriptive ones. Now the disease model of psychiatry has resurfaced in this pharmacological age. And we all know, and this, and this conference has many reminders of it, that we are hoping now that the clinical picture will lead us to the chemical agent, which is called disease process. And that extraordinary hypothesis is still under investigation. Now the history of neurology is illuminating, in my opinion, for why the syndromic emphasis is a dangerous one. My teachers told me that before the modern neurological examination was firmly in place, which took place, this change took place early in the 20th century, before neurologists carried around their little hammers and their pins to respectively to test out reflex situations and, and uh, dermatomal uh, affector distribution difficulties, before that, neurologists also depended upon the patient's reports. But with the, with the discovery of rapidly applicable, accurate and helpful objective test procedures on the human body, the reporting function in neurology took second place to objective test results. Now why haven't we been able to do that in psychiatry? Why haven't we found substantially usable, dependable objective tests which are the glory of general medicine and of neurology, why haven't we found those objective tests to free us from our almost helpless dependence on the reporting function of the patient? The first objective test that was advertised and applauded as being the answer to that problem for psychiatry was intelligence tests. It was hoped that because intelligence is so close to the synthesizing capacity and because the capacity to hold it together is a necessary ingredient for the best functioning of intelligence, that in the intelligence tests we had the kind of test that would allow us to elevate uh, psychiatry above the reporting function. Now, there are many other tests that have been introduced. Some of them, like the MMPI, even direct their attention to the lying function. The fact that patients deceive us and deceive themselves in an attempt to compensate for that. I don't want to go into many of those tests, which are of very great interest and may indeed contain the seeds of objective test procedures for the future. What I want to address is, why haven't they done the job? Why don't we use them routinely? Why are we still dependent 
largely on the reporting function. I think there are two answers, there are many answers to that, including professional turf debates and all kinds of things, but the two I want to, the two answers I want to uh, give to that are, are one, the problem of the normal, and then the problem of interactive effects. Now, among, the feminists among you will be delighted to learn that when army recruits in World War I were tested with the newly systematized intelligence tests, army recruits, male army recruits in World War I were tested, it was found that the average American male was of moronic intelligence. This produced, of course, enormous uh, public embarrassment. It produced a great deal of very funny uh, newspaper columns. Uh, it was hotly argued in the profession whether it was true or not. <laughs> the problem was cleverly avoided by statistical arrangements of the intelligence test scores. So this no longer shows up as a phenomenon in intelligence test results. But this, but this finding alerts us to this problem of what are we testing? Are we talking about averages and maybe low averages? Are we talking about health, the ideal intelligence? What are we talking about? Now this is a very hard question to answer. In our own field of, of investigation, it waxes and wanes. Some generations find that normality is common. Uh, normality in the sense of health is common. Other generations say it's rare. The influence of psychoanalysis tended to pathologize almost all human phenomena, despite Freud's disclaimer of that notion in part. Um, the early efforts at syndromic description of this present wave of syndromic description tended to restrict the syndromes to a relatively small part of the population. Look up uh, the wonderful little book uh, by, um, where's, my, where's my memory going? Guse, uh, Goodwin and Guse's first edition of their, of their descriptive account. And you'll see that there, health is a relatively common finding. But with the, with the spread and elaboration of our syndromes in DSM-4 particularly, it's really very hard to, not to find a place for all of us in some part of those, uh, of those descriptions, despite very careful efforts to avoid that problem. Existential psychiatry undertook uh, the same problem. At first, in existential work, it looked like we weren't going to use labels at all. Nobody was going to be sick. We were all going to accept each other and get with one another. Right? Then, however, in the development of existential psychiatry, the problem, the conviction grew and spread that in fact culture was, was squishing the, the capacities for health of most of us, that convention was, dis were, was depriving us of a kind of self-actualization which would have meant health. So as with the descriptive psychiatrists, gradually the concept of a broad group of healthy people disappeared. And in the existential literature, at this time, it's fair to say that the healthy individual is a rare, even heroic, exception to the poor, poor dopes like the rest of us who are wandering around in conventional seas. The other factor that has made a objective test in psychiatry formidable are the interactive effects. When I was a young man in my residency, <coughs> we used to have an extraordinary interviewer who could take a sensible seeming patient, bland and friendly and without obvious psychopathology, and within 15 to 20 minutes produce a creature, hallucinated, deluded, a kind of zoological monstrosity, replacing this, uh, this benign creature that the resident had presented. We had another extraordinary interviewer who did the reverse. Having, having come from uh, an interview with the first teacher, we would all, of course, be intent upon not missing the slightest hint of psychopathology in our victim. And so we could, would beat that interviewer to the punch 
by producing a zoological monster to, well, to equal what he might discover. But then our second interview would come in. The second interview would come in and in hardly any time at all. The two folks would be talking away, discussing heart-rending topics, frankly, without word salad, without any kind of interference from disturbed mental processes. Where had our syndromic monster gone? Nothing in the teaching of the disease school, nothing in psychoanalysis would explain this phenomenon. And yet it sometimes happened. Harry Stack Sullivan said that no one was schizophrenic when they talked to him. <laughs> Most of the profession laughed as you did. And many people used to say, especially in Boston, that that was because Sullivan was crazier than the patients. But nevertheless, it's true that there are interactive effects and the extent of them we are unable to quantify. Winnicott has taught us there are no babies, there are only babies and mothers. Sullivan taught us there are no patients, there are only interviewer and interviewee, as he said. So the effects are there, but again, they interfere with having relatively easy access to test objective tests. <clears throat> what, what is it? What is it that uh, we are trying to measure? What is it that we want objective tests to do for us? Well, in the 19th century, the answer was first given very clearly and remains the answer that the psychology textbooks use. That is, what we needed to measure was perception, cognition, motor behavior, will, and affect. In his autobiography, Kreplin mentions, or autobiographical remarks, Kreplin mentions that his greatest intellectual triumph was to defeat that functional view of mental illness, which was represented by Professor Zian of the University of Berlin in the late 19th century. His victory, Kreplin's victory, was not complete, was it? Because we still talk about uh, affective disorders and thought disorders. But, and, and, but Kreplin's disease idea is freshly triumphant. It's now triumphant, has been triumphant now for 20 years, over a still older conception of, the disease, of, the, of our field, the Visenya concept. The Visenya concept was very popular in the 19th century. And it claimed, it claimed that there was only one mental illness. And how deep you went into it depended upon the clinical picture. You started with anxiety, went to depression, then you got deluded, then you get demented, and you came back out that same way. This was the Visenya concept. Kreplin says that that concept works for the, many of the cases, but it doesn't work for all. Now you know you immediately recognize what the modern form of the Visenya concept is, psychoanalysis, which speaks about levels of regression, fixation, and a going back and forth in the pathology. And all of us know that however restricted that, that diagnostic system may be in psychiatry, we all believe that there are developmental aspects to psychopathology, so that the Visenya concept is very far from being uh, altogether dead. Kreplin thought that the trouble with the schizophrenics, he said a number of things in his writings, but one of the things he perhaps said most consistently was that the patients had some disorder of will. They couldn't hold it together. They couldn't be purposive. Pierre Genet, who, who laid the structure for our description and in some ways our understanding too of the neuroses, Genet felt that the central, psych central problem in mental illness was the loss of central energy which allowed for a containing of the various uh, phenomena of mental life. The hysterical people, he said, were split the way a diamond is split into large pieces. The schizophrenic, Janet said, broke like a piece of glass. Now this notion of a central synthesizing property is everywhere evident, not everywhere, but in many places evident. And let me give you just a few. Schneider's account of schizophrenia is, in my opinion, a very powerful one. 
But you remember in the Schneiderian symptoms that the consistent finding is of the failure of a center to hold. So that the patient is invaded by voices, is commanded by this. Thoughts can be captured out of their heads and thrown away. The center is not present in the schizophrenic Schneider described person. Psychoanalysis says something very similar. That is, the ego is deformed by the forms of conflict that are imposed upon it. And it struggles to make itself felt in the person against the power of these energized forces. Today, we, we hear in self-psychology as a part of, of psychoanalysis, we hear debates about the place of the self, the effectiveness of the self. And here again, we're hearing about something like a will phenomenon. I recommend to you a book written by a colleague of mine recently called A Simple Theory of the Self by David Mann, which attempts to describe topologically this central function and also to use the concept of, of ownership of mental elements, the degree of self-possession as essentially the defining feature as I am doing today in mental illness. It's much more difficult to describe what we mean by this central function than it is to describe what isn't present sometimes. We all know what it's like to lack purpose. We all know what it means to have a divided will or a will that overreaches itself. We all know how we feel when we're not in possession of ourselves. We know that for the most part under those circumstances we don't feel good or we feel bad. We also know that we have today many medications which are are rapidly and sometimes consistently effective in making us feel better. But we also know that time and again when we investigate that problem of will and purpose the abnegation of will or the division of, of, of purpose, when we investigate those things, what we find is that there is a division within the person, a conflict, a conflict between duty and desire, between the generations, uh, all kinds of conflicts that are, that are endemic to the, to the human condition. Now, these are the reasons, of course, why the person is hard to get at. And when we ask ourselves about this reporting function, and the difficulties in making it. Let us remember, let us keep in mind how complex the inner situation is. Can we trust people to tell us what they're like? I sometimes think that, that if you take a person's self-description and reverse it, you often get closer to the truth. And this may be only, this, this may be only a reflection of the, of the devious character of my friends. <laughs> But let me illustrate what I mean. I have noticed that people who are really generous often describe themselves as stingy because they're not as generous as they'd like to be. And I've noticed even more consistently that people that tell me that they are really generous <laughs> often seem to me among the stingier ones that I know. Perhaps the most wonderful example is narcissism. If someone tells me that they're narcissistic, I can be pretty sure that they're not. 